the Americas, a rich, vibrant region, vital to our interests and close to our borders. They are our allies, our major trading partners, our closest neighbors. Their choices will change our lives. Three nations, a half billion people. And all of them as much Americans as we are. Major funding for Americas was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Additional funding provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And viewers like you. Tenía, tenía mucha fantasía. When I was a child, I had a lot of fantasies, some hidden and some revealed. The ones I talked about were to be a missionary in Africa. I wanted to be many things. I wanted to be a politician, to be president of the republic. I have a note I wrote to my mother asking her to forgive me for misbehaving. I signed it, your daughter, Maria Antonieta, future president of Chile, and a future diplomatic, philosophical, psychological, literary, and courageous talent. They were not few, my aspirations. <laughs> When Maria Antonieta Sá was born, women in Chile didn't even have the right to vote. Now she is mayor of Conchalí, a city near the capital, Santiago. Her story reflects a new force in the region. As women in the Americas have shaped new lives with their own hands, they have changed their families, their communities, and their countries. Throughout Latin America, tradition teaches women that marriage is their dream and home and children their natural domain. The Virgin Mary is the symbol of selfless motherhood. Although many women never marry, caring for the family is still the center of their lives. Doris Meniconi devoted her life to her children. I was 20 when I got married. We had 13 children. It was a bustling household. Here I would have the tub. I would bathe one, give him the bottle, and put him to bed. Take the next, bathe him, give him the bottle, and so on. There was no distinction between boys and girls. They were all good kids, very healthy in spirit. So it was a bath twice a week in series. Gracias. 
tantos jóvenes los he visto crecer, los he visto en el barro, los he visto con los mocos colgando, los he visto... I have seen these kids grow up in the mud, dripping noses, bare bottoms and all. I really enjoy working with them. Uwe Torres grew up in great poverty. For poor women, tradition is tempered by need. We only had plastic shoes and the clothes that my mother made for us. I never wore leather shoes or used a brassiere, even when I got older. When I started dating, just before we got married, he bought me my first pair of shoes and my first bra. I will always remember those moments. Uwe Torres married at 17, hoping to escape the harsh conditions in which she lived. It was the late 1960s, a time when political ferment shook much of the world. In Chile, poor people mobilized for dramatic changes in their lives. In 1970, left-wing parties and labor unions formed a coalition called Popular Unity. They backed the socialist Salvador Allende for president Allende promised radical social and economic reforms. Allende won, but by a narrow margin. Parliament remained firmly in the control of conservative opposition parties. The wealthy still felt threatened. Allende's supporters were elated. When Allende was president, when Allende became president, we felt we had realized a dream. We were going to build an absolutely new and just society where there would be the new man. No one spoke of the new woman. Dreams were flourishing, and everybody dreamed. President Allende's call for a Chilean road to socialism inspired workers and poor people to take over factories and farms. Uwe Torres left a squatter's settlement to help build a new neighborhood on reclaimed land. This was all a field of wheat. It was harvested by all of us and sold to buy things for the neighborhood. When we came here, there was no water, no electricity, nothing. Selling the wheat helped us to get what we needed. The popular unity government pursued radical reforms, but they still saw women in terms of their traditional roles. Women were recruited for education and health care campaigns, which seemed closest to family work. At the time, I worked as a doctor in the north of Chile. 
Our participation as women was very extensive, and those of us who were political activists thought that we would rapidly achieve women's full liberation by building socialism. Looking back, I see that we were quite naive. Evaluating our real participation, only a small minority of women were treated as the equals of men. Most did menial tasks, which were like doing domestic duties within the parties. I was a national delegate to the Workers' Central Union. I had to attend the plenary session with all the top leaders of the different unions. I was the only woman there. I was young, and miniskirts were in fashion then. When I arrived, everyone was disconcerted. I sat down in the first row, and then I had to move back, because the mini was a bit, well, they got a bit distracted. At first they were surprised, then they tried to be indifferent. But when I talked, they really didn't pay proper attention. As the government nationalized mines, industries and banks, Allende's economic policies polarized the nation. Strikes and street demonstrations became daily events. Men and women from all walks of life were drawn into the conflict. Doris Meniconi's children strongly supported the president. I was sewing when I saw my son Miguel on television giving a speech from the window at the school where he was studying. I was scared and I wanted to know why my son was speaking like that. My oldest, who was with me, said, Calm down, Mom, you'll find out what he's doing. When Miguel got home, I asked him, What were you doing? And he said, I am demanding modern materials for the schools because everything is old. And from then on, I was on edge because it was scary and I didn't understand much. Right-wing forces, secretly supported by the United States, stepped up their destabilization campaign. They sabotaged the economy by blocking transportation and encouraging shopkeepers to hoard consumer goods. Many women blamed the long lines and severe shortages on Allende. The right wing played on the discontent of upper and middle class women, urging them to speak out. I had a baby girl at that time and I couldn't knit clothes for her because there was no wool in the market. I had to unravel old clothes in order to knit new ones. Friends had to bring me diapers from here and there. I even had to bring alcohol and cotton to the hospital. Anti-government protests began early on, starting with the marches of the pots, which were done only by women. After that, the opposition began to grow. There were constant protests, and as a student, I took part in them. The marches of the pots had a profound effect. The image of well-to-do women protesting in the streets was new and startling and helped strengthen the conservative opposition. We women went out into the streets to demand an end to the Marxist government. We wanted freedom for our children. We asked all the armed forces, through letters, with marches, with whatever means. Our women have played an important role in the life of the country and have changed the direction of society. 
However, our participation has been like that of a Greek chorus, which appears and disappears. At times of profound crisis, when the country faces dramatic situations, women appear and act with great strength and conviction. They are motivated by fundamental concerns, like the protection of life, security, the need to provide their family with food and a good future. This moves all women, young, old, everyone. Chile was sliding towards chaos. The economy was in ruins. Left and right-wing demonstrators faced off each day. Both sides lived in fear. El año 72. In 1972, my oldest son had a great idea. He said, let's have Christmas here with all my brothers and sisters. And when we had the table set, he said, make sure you remember this Christmas. I was taken by that. He said, this may be the last Christmas that we all share together. Never forget this table where we're all gathered. There was a bit of tension, but then he started joking and it passed. And that was really the last Christmas, because Christmas of 1973 was very different. On September 11th, 1973, a military coup d'etat overthrew the popular unity government. Salvador Allende died in the presidential palace. The coup shattered Chile's long tradition of democracy. The commander-in-chief of the armed forces, General Augusto Pinochet, took power as head of a military junta. When the military intervention came, that night I cried. Something important in which I had always believed, the democracy of which we Chileans felt tremendously proud, was broken. Still, that was what I wanted. That was what we had struggled for all this time. I felt that the roof was opening up and that once again I was free. That's what I felt, plus an enormous gratitude towards those who had done it. Immediately after the coup, the military seized thousands of Allende supporters. Union activists, community organizers, university professors, and anyone suspected of leftist leanings. Many were killed. Many fled. And many were disappeared. El golpe significaba the coup meant we had to struggle for life, to go on living and organizing. That day you felt the sadness while you drove around picking up people, looking for places where they could hide. When you look back, you see that you swallowed the pain because you didn't even have time to cry. 
but I think the sorrows still lie very deep within us. Doris Meniconi's house was raided four days after the coup. Her children and her husband went into hiding. I keep myself company with my plants because here my family was torn apart. Right here, this is the top of a drainage hole. The neighbors reported that my children were hiding weapons. The military came straight here. They found only some old tools, pieces of construction materials, tubing and so on. Doris's son Miguel was detained in November 1974. He has never been seen again. Two months later, his wife Lupita gave birth to twins. There is a reality I want to put here, my broken home, and this tree for my son who has disappeared. In memory of the last Christmas I spent with my children. You think you're strong, but you have a heart that doesn't just pump blood. When they came here, Lupita saw the photo, and I also had this placard, which I carry in my struggle to know the truth. It says, where are they? She told my grandchildren, that is your father, the love of my life. They took it, they caressed it, and they asked, where did my father sit? Where did he sleep? They went over and saw the bear, which I made from a jacket that Miguel always wore when he was working in the countryside. And the three of them took it and hugged it. And Lupita smelled it, and she said, it smells like my Miguel. And for me, that was terrible, but it also gave me strength because I didn't get rid of his jacket, and for them it's like having their father. The children slept with it, the boy one night and the girl the next. In their sleep, they were still hugging the bear. I will always have him with me, because there's a bit of him in everything that you see here. I live with the memories. Me tomaron presa en una casa de de un barrio de un sector medio de Santiago. I was taken prisoner in a house in a middle-class neighborhood of Santiago and was taken with another activist to the Via Grimaldi. Naked, helpless, I was subjected to tortures like the grill. It was a metal bed. They would apply electric shocks to the most sensitive parts of your body. They would run an electric prod all over you. Your mouth was gagged so that your screams couldn't be heard, and they played deafening music to drown out the screams. I'll never forget that for several days I was tortured to the music of the Concierto de Aranjuez. Afterwards, it was hard for me to listen to that music, but I set my mind to overcome it and to work it out with others. Villa Grimaldi was a secret detention center. Thousands of people were imprisoned by the military in places like this. Here, Marisa Matamala shared a cell with Nubia Becker. 
who is returning to the now abandoned site for the first time. All my memories come flooding back. It's strange to be in a place where life goes on so normally, when this place was once so frightful. Villa Grimaldi was a terrible place, a place that really meant horror. Day and night, you could hear the screams of the tortured, which is a very unique cry. One of the things that violated women most was the brutality of the violence against them. They looked for the breasts to hit you, or the vagina to put an electrode. They looked for the most sensitive and prurient parts of your body to torture you. It was done specifically to torment you. There is always a power relationship that becomes violent between a woman and her torturer. All the time they are trying to impose that power and obliterate you. With them, machismo was really extreme, with no constraints whatsoever. We were punished because we had misbehaved, gone beyond the proper boundaries, and it was our fault that we were here. They rejected women's involvement in politics because they believed women should be at home. Women should only look after the family. And to them it was very offensive, a break with tradition, for women to be involved in other things. For them it was routine. Afterwards they could continue eating or talking about soccer, about the music they were playing. They keep up the most absurd conversation while they were hurting a defenseless human being. It's so strange to be here now, knowing that all this we are seeing was also taking place at that time. We could hear church bells, but we couldn't imagine that all of this was happening as we are seeing it now. We heard the noises, but it was very difficult to imagine the reality. You felt completely isolated from the world. Once you went through these gates, you had no idea of what was going to happen. You might never come out. You didn't know. During the 1970s, many countries in Latin America were under military rule. To consolidate his power, General Pinochet suspended the Constitution and closed Congress. Political activities and strikes were banned. The military took over all public institutions. First Lady Lucia de Pinochet took charge of the government programs for women. These programs were used to build support for the military and to reinforce women's traditional roles. For many poor women, these programs were the only source of training and benefits since the government had greatly reduced social services. Conservative women were encouraged to volunteer their help as a patriotic duty. Las mujeres de la comunidad recibían la labor nuestra. Women in the community received our help in the spirit of friendship. We approached them as friends. 
We had a program called Maximizing Resources. We taught them how to reuse all the little things one throws away at home. And they received our help with enthusiasm. They became our friends, and that was the nicest thing. We had a million friends. With political parties outlawed and the labor movement crippled, economic policies favored the rich. Alicia Romo was one of the few women appointed to high office under General Pinochet. She became national director of industry and commerce in 1974. For Chile to be where it is today, to truly develop economically, it was necessary to implement a series of changes. We had to reduce the size of the state and make people understand that they were responsible for managing their own finances, not the state through fixed prices. We had to break many myths held by Chileans. To do this, we needed a long time, and power had to be concentrated in a strong hand who could make changes without debate. That was the fundamental legacy of the military government. The government privatized state enterprises and promoted new exports like fruit. In Chile's central valleys, small farms gave way to export crops. This change had a profound impact on women's traditional ways of life. Before, the town was poorer because there was less work. There were very few jobs, just work for men. Now, with the grapes, there's more work, especially for women. Almost all the women work in agriculture, in the fields, and later in packing plants. Josefina Chandia lives in the village of Andacollito, 300 miles north of Santiago. She is one of thousands of women who can only find work during the fruit growing season. The women work long hours in the fields with no access to drinking water or bathroom facilities. They trim the grapes carefully so they will grow to a perfect shape for consumers in the United States, Europe and Japan. <laughs> During the harvest season, women work in the packing plants. They get four cents for each box they clean and pack. You work at least 15 hours a day on your feet. You go in at 1 in the afternoon and you come out at 5.30 or 6 the next morning. When I'm working in packing, I have to leave my two girls with my mother-in-law. I drop them off on Sunday nights. 
They have to be there all week. They can't stay with me because I get out of work at dawn, so I only see them on Sunday during the day. December, January, and February. Those are the months of packing. Pinochet's free market policies affected life in the cities too. Cheaper imports flooded the market. Factories closed and unemployment soared, reaching 30%. The military saw these as the inevitable social costs of fixing the economy. In poor neighborhoods, people went hungry. Women like Uwe Torres organized communal kitchens, pooling their few pennies and soliciting donations of food and firewood. Every day, she and her neighbors cook for 200 people. For many families, this is their only meal of the day. For me, it was really difficult to join the kitchen, even though I'm one of the founders, because neighbors make so many remarks. Oh, look who's going to the communal kitchen, and so on. You're a shame. It hurts your dignity to think me in a communal kitchen. Why, if my husband has two good hands and can work, why should I be in this kitchen? So for me, it was really terrible to have to join, and not just for me, but for my friends as well. We had a member who didn't have food for her children for a whole week. She wanted to kill herself and the children out of despair. I heard about it and brought her to join the kitchen. I joined the kitchen because my husband and my father were out of work, and at home we had no food. My neighbors suggested I join them, and I've been coming here four years now. It breaks the routine of being home alone. Here there's a different atmosphere. It's so lively. We feel really proud because we're feeding our children. Of course, it's a great effort. Sometimes it's raining, you still have to cook, and you get all muddy. It's really hard to bring the wood in because the entrance is so narrow. But it helps us out in so many ways. Everything you see here we did by ourselves, all of us. The shed, everything that you see is the result of our efforts. Desperation over hunger led Uwe Torres and her neighbors to band together. Desperation over the fate of loved ones led women whose relatives had been disappeared to join together too. Their status as mothers gave their protests moral authority and made it hard for the government to suppress them. Under the auspices of the Catholic Church, the women sewed their stories into tapestries or arpilleras and smuggled them abroad to publicize the human rights violations of the military regime. Doris Meniconi became a part of the group soon after her son was taken. The cops told us that the biggest mistake the military made when they took our relatives 
was that they left us alive. They should have killed us along with them. That is what the police told us one time. We met each other when we were looking for our loved ones, thinking they were prisoners, or in the worst case, dead, but not this tragedy of the disappeared. In 1975, we were taught to do this work. We learned that this served us as therapy, as a source of income, and to spread the word. This is the work that Anna mentioned. This is the first piece done showing the drama that we lived. In the first picture, the telephone is very big because the mother gets the news over the phone that her son has been detained. We women, the mothers and relatives of the disappeared, were the first to go out into the streets carrying placards and demanding truth and justice for our loved ones. Then the repression would start. They would spray us with water cannons, drag us, detain us, and interrogate us at the police stations. Here we chained ourselves in front of Congress. During a chaining, during our hunger strike, we were always tense. When we went to chain ourselves, we were sure we would go to jail. We were in a dictatorship, but we did it. Everyone's legs were shaking, but we were searching for truth. We will always demand truth and justice, no more, no less. Nineteen eighty-three marked the tenth anniversary of the military coup. Chile was in its worst economic crisis since the depression. For the first time since the coup, people began to openly defy the military. Protesters took to the streets demanding bread, jobs, justice and liberty. Chilean women, influenced by those in exile and by the international women's movement, linked the call for democracy with the struggle for women's equality. I've been working semi-clandestinely since 1973, writing for a newspaper, and suddenly I began to think of myself. What's happening to me as a woman? What is my role? We began to meet with other women and to look for the roots of our history. We made a strong connection with Olga Poblete and Elena Cafarena, who had been the leaders of the suffragist movement of Chilean women. In the 1930s and 40s, women from all classes fought together for the right to vote. They finally won in 1949. Now the old leaders joined the younger women in calling for democracy in the country and the home. Elena and I were the matriarchs, the oldest ones in these groups. The culmination of these women's movements was a meeting of 11,000 women. The Caupolicán theater was filled to capacity, and no men were admitted. 
The women who gathered that night crossed class and political lines. Their unity set an example for the fragmented opposition to Pinochet. A group called Women for Life channeled this unity into street actions. Their slogan was, Somos Mas, there are more of us. This is the 1985 march when the police attacked us. When they got near us, before they hit us with water cannons, a spontaneous sign appeared, which was to say, we have clean hands. From then on, in all our actions, whenever the police came close, we said, clean hands. It was a contrast. You repress us, we are clean. Despite the repression, women were on the front lines of the protests. In 1988, people pinned their hopes for change on a plebiscite to be held according to the constitution drafted by the military. A yes or C vote would authorize another eight years of military rule. A no vote would allow free presidential elections. Both sides targeted women in their media campaigns. The C campaign stressed Chile's improving economy and tried to revive women's fears of the turmoil of the Allende years. Mortalidad infantil, analfabetismo, falta de viviendas, falta de esperanzas, de dignidad femenina, de paz, de futuro, nunca más pobreza, desamparo, hambre, cesantía, incertidumbre. Hay una sola manera de responderle a lo que todos queremos para Chile. Sí, sí, sí. The No Coalition of center and left-wing parties promised an end to repression with the return of democracy. Their TV campaign dared to feature women making fun of Pinochet. Women were active on both sides of the campaign. Up to the very day of the plebiscite, we didn't believe it was possible to vote out the dictatorship with a pencil. That with a pencil saying no, we could defeat such a brutal dictatorship that had mistreated us so badly. In October 1988, Chileans went to the polls, with women still voting separately from men, according to law. 51% of women and 58% of men voted against military rule. The no won. 
General Pinochet was forced to hold presidential elections. In 1990, for the first time in 20 years, an elected president, Patricio Aylwin, took office. Despite the role women played in his success, no women were appointed to the new cabinet. The political representation of women in Chile has always been poor. It was very bad in the military government and it's worse today. In the ministries, we don't have a single woman. The positions women do have are of no political importance. No women's voices are heard at the table of our great national discussions. That year, President Aylwin appointed 15 mayors. Maria Antonieta Sá was the only woman. I never had so much power to make decisions as now. I'd always been part of a group. I had never been in public office. I had never had a secretary. And now I have power. Sometimes I sing that song that says, my word is law. It's a wonderful thing to be able to make things happen, to make decisions that have concrete results. For example, I can decide whether to improve one neighborhood or another. I get a lot of letters. You, as a woman, can understand this situation. It's true, most of the problems in the community are family problems, like housing, health, education. We women have been queens in the kingdom of necessity, queens without power. People think that because I'm a woman, I can be more sensitive to their problems and can make a commitment. We've established a channel of affection, a closeness with people, which is very nice and is very rewarding personally. Maria Antonieta Sa is the first woman to have the mayor's honor of leading the Independence Day celebrations in Conchalí. Breaking new ground has always been her aspiration.
Ahí, por este ladito, ya. Ya, vamos. Salud, salud. Salud, salud, salud. ¿eh? salud, salud, salud. 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 Y a poquito nomás. <risa> Over the last 30 years, the spiritual landscape of the Americas has changed radically. And now, for many, miracles are not enough. Next time on Americas. Major funding for Americas was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Additional funding provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And viewers like you. To place your order or for more information about video cassettes, off air videotaping, and books based on the Americas series, call 1 800 Learner. This is PBS. The companion book to Americas, written by Peter Wynn and published by Pantheon Books, is available. Illustrated with over 100 color and black and white photos, this 656-page hardcover volume is available for $40 plus handling. To order, call 1-800-647-3600. Please have your credit card ready.